Welcome to another G4 Guitar Hangout. David Hart's my name, usual format. We're going to jump into some questions with the guys and uh, see what we can learn. Um, so what I'll do now, first of all, I'll just check with you, Trevor, first. Trevor, have you got any questions or uh, topics that you'd like to discuss tonight? Um, nothing. Well, I was going to mention about the um, free downloads, uh, you know, the G4 method download that we offer. Yep. Um, I was just kind of curious about some of the other feedback on how well those have been going. Um, and also, I wanted to ask about the um, melodic arpeggios that we're doing now on the G4 method. So it's just a couple of things I wanted to ask about yep. that, really. Okay, cool. Yeah, because that's, that's come up today. So yeah, we'll talk about that, talk about the arpeggios. Uh, okay, David, did you want to discuss anything? I'm not sure if David's still there because we were just having a chat. He might have popped off for a minute. Okay, all right. So we'll, we'll start on that, um, and, yeah, we'll see what we get. So so first of all, with the the melodic arpeggios, basically the way it's going to work is that a, a few of the teachers have, have said, which which I do understand. Um, you know, I, I think with my students, especially my senior students, I didn't do it with the junior students, but my senior students, I did teach them the melodic arpeggios in that level one, but my level one took a, a, a bit longer than the one now. We, we actually made the one now a little bit easier so students could finish S1. So I, I do, it kind of took a little while for, for it to sink in, but I get what they're saying in that it kind of now that we've expanded the, the old S1 into like an S1, S2, senior one and senior two, then that those melodic arpeggios are a little bit hard compared to the other skills there. So what we've done is simply taken the melodic arpeggios that were on senior level one and move them to senior level two. So in senior level one now, they only have to do the harmonic arpeggios. They don't need to do the melodic arpeggios. Right. Yeah. And then when they go to senior two, they actually do the, the, the what was originally the level one arpeggios. So in other words, the harmonic arpeggios in senior level one and, and now the melodic arpeggios in senior level two. So that's going to be like the A minor, E minor, G, C ones. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So they won't need to do, in, in when they're on C level 2, there'll be the other chords there and, and the arpeggios, which only have to be done as harmonic minor, uh, uh, yeah, the harmonic arpeggio, sorry. Um, right. Whereas the, the melodic arpeggios, the versions of those won't be done until the level 3. So you kind of, the melodic arpeggios are always at the next level. Okay, I get you. Yeah. So it kind of keeps it, yeah, one step behind and uh, in balance as far as your yeah, difficulty is concerned. Because they are, they are a little bit harder because you, yeah, depends. So, some of them are harder, but some of them are. And they don't apply at all on the junior um, kind of uh, checklists at all. We don't worry about those at all on that. No, the juniors just do, they do the very simple arpeggios. So they're just playing the one finger C. Uh, yeah, G7, G chords, uh, and that's it for, for junior level one, junior level two. They, we do introduce those, a couple of those arpeggios, but we're still not doing melodic arpeggios until level three, really. Yeah. Right. Okay, thanks. Cool. Um, okay, so, sorry, what was the other thing you wanted to talk about? The Oh, the, uh, uh, the free downloads that, that's offered where you basically have um, to do with the kind of Facebook ads where people get a free download of the G4 method and then you can kind of follow up with a, a phone call or an email or whatever. Um, yep. And I, I just was kind of curious what other people's experiences have been with that because I've found some of the people, I think there's quite a kind of tendency of people, they just want to download the method free and I think we have to fill the form in to get the, the method, and then when you kind of try and follow up on it, I don't know that many of them are actually really interested in taking the guitar lessons. They just kind of want the method for free. But I didn't know mm -hmm. if that's just been the people that I've contacted or if it's, you know, what the kind of take-up rate is. It's just kind of curious, really, on that one. Yeah, well, the, the generally that's normal uh, because the... The online traffic, it depends where your traffic comes from and uh, if you've got people who are just finding your website uh, casually 
through you know whatever medium. It, it, it really depends on where your traffic's coming from. If your traffic is coming from from ads that you're running specifically to learn guitar through you know the G4 the Facebook marketing, you should get a higher percentage of people who are taking the download signing up. But if your traffic is coming from other sources, just general sources, then it it these are people who aren't really looking for lessons or a teacher, but they are looking to learn guitar. So there, there, there are those, those two different strategies. But something that's worth noting statistically that seems to happen is that if you get you know 1% of people who, who reach your website becoming a student, you're doing well. That's pretty well what the stats are across the board. Okay. Yeah. And, right. And, yeah. So our, our forms, by the way, are, are quite attractive. The website's attractive, the, the, how it looks. Uh, I, I know it matches all the, you know, the latest, uh, you know, highly converting websites. So people who go there who may not be highly interested in lessons have a look at that and go, wow, that looks good. I, I think I'll grab a copy of that. So you might be getting that happening. Where are you? Are you emailing them mostly, or are people leaving their phone number? What's happening? If there's a phone number, I'll call the number. If if there's only an email address, then I'll just send the email. So. Um, yeah, yeah. I do use the phone number if there is one there. Okay. Um, it, 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 yeah. Sorry. Well, carry on. Yeah, I was just going to say one of the things that that and I learned this years ago um, through one of my marketing coaches that when when we do uh, if we don't keep accurate stats that are happening, what we tend to do is get caught up in the ups and downs of it, and and it can be quite emotional where you'll you'll get one or two bad calls or people who sort of say, oh, I have no interest, don't call me and hang up on you or something like that where you, you're not really keeping the accurate stats. But when you look at the, the overall accurate stats and really keep them, and, and you may or may not be doing this, but really noting out how many have I got, how many people left phone numbers, how many did emails, how many emails responded, how many phone calls were receptive. Once you start to really look at those stats, then you get a better idea of how your marketing is statistically how it's working, and then it, it, you can tweak it. So you can sort of say, well, maybe I could handle the phone calls a bit better. Maybe the email I'm sending is not uh, really responsive enough. Maybe there's something about it that needs to change the title. So you, you're constantly sort of looking at all these these numbers, and then the idea is that you you tweak it, but also you get a bit of a feel for what to expect because people. It, it, it's so predictable. We know with the flyers that do a thousand flyers, it, it it averages out pretty well to one in a thousand. And if you look, especially the, the the numbers you do, you look at over a large number, you can see those average out. So so to some degree, people are quite predictable, and that's how I know that the big companies do it. Your McDonald's and your your shopping centres, your uh, Tesco's and all that, they all work on predictable human behaviours, and. That way, you, you can start to see trends, and then you know what to expect. And then that what that does is is tells you your value of your marketing. So if you look at your marketing budget over a year, and you go, "Hey, I spent ten thousand dollars or five thousand pounds," and you say, "But I picked up twenty five students, I picked up fifty students," then you can look at it and go, "This is good value." Um, but if you if you look at it over a small time or, or not don't keep the stats, and you look at your profit and loss statement. For that year, you might have invested, like I said, five thousand pounds, and you picked up your thirty students, but you're not seeing it in dollars because those students haven't fully matured yet. In other words, you don't actually see the return on your investment for a couple of years. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that no, makes sense. Yeah. All right, yeah, yeah. See the cool. bigger picture, I guess, really. Yeah, it's seeing the the, the investment, and you know, if you look at uh, one of the examples, that was, and I'll, I'll mention the seminar a bit tonight because there was a lot of really good things that came out of it. But one of the things they spoke about was that that the businesses that are valuable today, when you come to sell a business, are businesses that, that have subscribers. So, in other words, if if I'm a restaurant and and I say, you know, we turn over about, you know, say five thousand pounds a week, and our expenses are two thousand, therefore we're profiting three thousand pounds a week for our restaurant. When someone's buying that restaurant, they're looking at it and going, "Yeah, but maybe that's because you, you know it's just been some good traffic here, or maybe uh, you're you're inflating the figures, or perhaps you know the chef is a good chef and that chef will go when I take over the restaurant." So all these little things that they're thinking about. Whereas 
when people were in, in the world of business, buying and selling businesses, today the businesses that have subscribers, so if I go to your business and say, how many people are subscribing to you on a monthly basis? And you show me the figures and I can see the actual students and I can ring some of those students randomly and check that they are actual genuine subscribers, uh, then uh, there's a value on your business. So the, the comparison of a subscriber type business, which is what we're doing, to a business where people just pay casually or pay when they like, or you've got to chase them for money, it's a very different model and that's where the value of a subscri subscription business is far higher uh, these days than, than other businesses. So just something to keep in mind. Sure. Okay, cool. Um, so I, I can, just, just for any of you guys, just so you know, if I was to put a value on any of your businesses, um, I would put a value of about $1,000, say £500 per student subscribed. So if you told me that you had 20 students subscribed, then I would value your business um, at $20,000 or £10,000. That, that's, that's what I'd be prepared to give you as a valuation for subscribers. If you didn't have subscribers and you just had students who were, were coming and you were invoicing and paying them, I, I, I would put a lot lower value. Even if you had the same amount of students, I would put at least half the value because I want to see subscribers. Subscribers to me are people who are committed to your business. So. Um, all right, cool. So I'll just go to uh, David. Do you have any questions that you want to raise? Topics? Um, I think really. Um, just one off, off um, the the top of my head is is like gift vouchers, Christmas gift vouchers. Always seem to do well. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to get some um, posters put up around here, and and I've booked um, a Christmas market uh, stall thing, you know, like Ben does. Um, and on Facebook, it, uh, people, it's looking like at the moment there's nearly around 2,000 people who are going to attend who've clicked on they will attend on the Facebook page. So yeah. um, so I'm going to have the stall and, and basically just model what Ben, ben Messenger does really. So. Um, I'm just thinking: Do we have do we have any uh, poster templates that that I could use um, just to get printed and and start hitting that maybe at the end of October, early November? Yeah, absolutely. I've got um, some poster designs on the website. Um, if you go to, I'll just tell you. If you go to the marketing section, um, I'll just make sure that it's still the same because we've just updated the website. Make sure we can find it. So it'll be under marketing, offline marketing, and if I'm cutting out, it's because of the website loading. And then you'll see signs. So just click on signs. Okay. Right. There's some designs there. Okay. Yeah. If, if you if you get uh, like, you know, we can do the design. No problem. I can I can give you that. And that's part of what I spoke about before. Um, but if you want uh, it done is high quality, uh, so in other words it needs to be done at a high standard for a big sign. Uh, we make what we call a vector uh, image and that costs, because we've got to pay the, the designer to do it in vector, um, it's $55 Australian to have a vector image which you can then take to a printer and have printed. The other is to take the design that we give you, take it to the printer and they might be able to make it up as well. So. Yeah, that's what you, that's what I've done um, previously, and, and they've come they come out really high high def. So um, yeah, that's all you need. Then. Yeah, to do that. So yeah, yeah, it it, it really if you got a printer, it'll do it. Yeah, definitely do that. Um, and then uh, yeah, but have a look there, and then you can see the, the the designs. I can make up the design, and then you can take it to your printer, and they can put it together for you. And the picture, like the yeah, have you got because they're in our file. Like if you go to the downloads. We've got all the, the pictures there, the photos, the high quality images. So if they want any to use any of those, you can give them those. Okay. okay. All right, cool. But yeah, if you need any help, just let me know on that one. Um, so yeah, we, so when's that? What date is that? Um, it's the 19th, it's over two days. So it's the 18th and 19th of December. Okay. Good. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I think last year they had a huge, huge turnout. So it's it's in what we call Lee Sports Village, because uh, it's quite a sporty town around here. They've just built like a new rugby stadium and 
Um, and, and pretty much uh, Elton John played there when, when it opened up. Um, okay. Last year and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, and on the car park, it's quite huge. So they're just setting up loads of market stalls. Um, and local businesses can book those market stalls. Um, some will be selling, like, drinks and Christmassy stuff. But I thought if we could template what Bed Message is doing and then take the card reader and all that stuff and just try and set, print out loads of methods and just try and try and sell yeah. them on the... Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, excellent. And, and you know, the, those getting out there and, and meeting people, it's... I, I love it. It's, it's a great day out because uh, you, you, you start to get a bit of a feel, a bit of a vibe and I always came away from whenever I did those kind of things. I, I did a couple of markets but I did shopping centres and, and I always came away really pumped, uh, you know, because you're talking to people throughout the day and a lot of people are keen to learn and you're signing up students and it just feels like, wow, if every day was like this, it would just go crazy, uh, you know, the, the business would just go through the roof. But that's what it is because it's all about numbers. We know it's a numbers game. The more people that we meet and talk to, the more students you're going to sign up. It's as simple as that. Excellent. Um, have you been to one of Ben's? Have you seen one of his stalls? I've seen them on his Facebook page, but yeah, maybe I should make pay a visit. You know, once he's he's um, doing one, yeah. see the vibe and what what he's doing. But, but yeah. For sure, I think because he's got a, he's got some experience now, and so you know if you went and spend an hour or two with him while he's doing it, you can just watch and see how he does it and approaches people, and yeah, I think it'd be a good thing to do. Yeah, yeah, cool. To find out when his next next one is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Shane, have you got any good questions for us tonight? I think we were going to elaborate on a topic from the other night. Shane, are you there, Shane? Might be. Yeah, I'm yeah. Great. Um, yeah, yeah, we were talking about doing a uh, development course for yep. toddlers. Um, yeah, def still, uh, I was interested in that. I haven't called any colleges yet, but I think I'll, I'll do that this week. Okay. Just to try to get someone on board. Yeah. And I, and so, I think... Um, sorry, you go. Sorry, go, go, no, you go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just, just going to say, think about about your time and, and you know, everything. And I, I really think that the Facebook campaign for someone to do that, I think we could really narrow it down and target the right people uh, to do... Okay. Yeah, to, to get... Because you want to get a bunch of candidates and then interview them and find the best person rather than, uh, you know, if you're running around chasing and looking for them, um, it can become a lot of time yeah. consuming for you. And you think about your time, you know, your time is money um, and just get Facebook to do the legwork for you. Yeah, yeah. okay, cool. So that would be the first thing. Um, as far as a, a program and, 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 you know, You've got to think about that as well. You've got to think about, okay, what are they going to do? And so I'd, I'd get them to put the program together for you, come in and show you, okay, what would you teach this age group? Uh, so you, you're kind of half looking for uh, someone who's keen to do it um, at a reasonable cost and also who's going to help out with the program and, and take yeah. it from there. Um, the And then, of course, you've got to follow up with the marketing of it. So once you... Once you start doing it, then you're going to have to have a marketing program to appeal to to early development programs. So maybe start looking around at what other people are doing, what other schools are doing. Um, a, a, another possibility, if you want to do this, is to think about uh, it, ringing around other music schools that have already got early development programs and just inquiring about it and finding out about it and going down and having a look. Just take your your baby down with you and just say, look, you know, not for now, but just want to check it out and see what you guys are doing. Yeah, right. I actually uh, go to a few with my daughter already. Okay, um, cool. So I got a pretty good idea of, you know, what goes on and and how to structure it and stuff like that. Yeah, excellent. So, it, it's, it's not hard. I mean, I, I watch them. They're pretty... Pretty straightforward. It's more about the personality and, and keeping it yeah. fun. <laughs> exactly. 
it's don't don't go too hard on the uh, practice logs <laughs> with the little <Yeah>. ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I've been doing. Uh, I can't remember who recommended it to me now. Someone, some G4 teacher said I should do musicology, which is like a book for kids under four learning music. Yep, yep. might have been Emma. That, and that's. Yep. Um, I can't remember who it was. Yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah, so that's been really good, actually, and I considered either either using that book or sort of using a similar method to that. Yeah. Um, What's it called again? Also, musicology. Sorry. It's like musicology, like a cacao. Oh, right. Okay. M -O -O. Musicology. Yep. Yeah. It's really good, actually. I do it with my daughter every day. Okay, cool. Um, I'll check it out. Yeah. It's, and then the, the author of that book also wrote a book for adults to, about learning music, for, about the benefits of teaching your children music. And actually, she cites the study that you were talking about on Monday. Um, okay about that woman who kind of debunked the listening to Mozart thing. Yeah, Francis Rauscher. And yep. Yeah. So I've been trying to cite that book to parents to get them to read it because I thought it might get them to sign people up. Yeah. So there, there's a so there's a thing where, where there's a whole kind of community of people who sort of gather together around this. This is what I discovered anyway. And the, the young mothers who sort of you know, when, when someone becomes a, a young mother, especially fathers too, but what happens is that they start looking up blogs and investigating and learning about things and some of them come across the music and the benefits of learning music at an early age and then they get them into these young development classes. So if you can sort of get yourself somewhere in that, maybe you could even uh, participate on a blog, like where you could, you could be a, a guest blogger for a, a local blog in your area that's directed towards mothers, things like that, where you can get some credibility for yourself um, in that space. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if, anyway, if you've got knowledge on a topic, uh, guest blogging is something that's really good to do. And if you write that, if you write, a, you want to write a blog and put it on the G4 too, and that applies to any of you that want to put something on, um, you know, the G4 blog. If you feel it's a topic, because a lot of you have some very, uh, you know, interesting information that you picked up from different places. Sounds like you're on a highway there, are you, Shane? Uh, not a highway, just, just a road. road. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. No problem. Okay, cool. So, yeah, that's pretty well. Um, sounds like we've covered it. Unless you've got any, you've got any other questions you wanted to ask around that? Um, no, I'll just try to get a Facebook thing together. Um, yep. See how that goes. Cool. All right. And may, maybe make a Facebook page as well, early development Facebook page. Uh, you know, okay. give it some cool name. Like you've got this musicology, come up with some other cool name for your yeah. um, your program. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right, excellent. Um, ben, have you got any questions, topics? discuss today? Nothing burning. I was still wondering if I could speak to you about the method, but that'll be easier on the by email, won't it? Uh, no, you can go. Here, you can go here. Okay. Um, well, yeah, obviously I changed a fair number of those pages, and I know we got to that integration bit, and I see what you're saying. Totally fair enough. And I think I am not quite doing enough of the song. What did you call, what did you call it? Skills to songs? Yeah, or skills songs. to songs. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I'm quite doing enough of that, but I've got I've got a lesson yesterday that would be a good example to show you and say, is this enough or is that too much or not enough? Anything along those along those lines? Yeah. But yeah, I was just wondering about the other pages because I know you were thinking it seems like a huge deal. Leave it until 2016. It would be great if I could get just kind of a few of them going. For example, the chords. I haven't changed much except put on that three stages bit. Yeah. And I would yep. like to have the three stages written down just for the that first lesson where people always, I can get some people understanding it, but not quite to the point where they're still able to practice it in that half hour. 
when you've still got to kind of go through the method and do the picking first and then technique for the chords yeah. and then how to practice the chords. I think it would be good to have some things written down. So if any of them could be kind of one by one, maybe yeah. just week by week, whatever so, you've got for time. So, so just to, because uh, some, some people will be listening to this video, can you explain the three stages? Um, yeah, that was just the single strings of the chord, so arpeggiate it. Then yeah. if that's good, you move on to the strum. Then if that's good, you relax your hand. And I've written in brackets, tap your leg, because that's a good one for forcing yeah. people to relax the hand. Yeah. And that's what you were kind of going for with the golf putt technique, I think, with the yeah. kind of recent addition to the page. But that would then need the teacher to explain the golf putt technique and they'd need to remember it. I think the three stages is kind of not so detailed that it's too much for a beginner student. It's just yeah. good enough to help them get that first week of practice really well done. Yeah. Would it would it help to have a separate sheet, do you think, with these kind of things That's on it? Well do. Have a look at what I've done and see what you think, because I took out one yeah. of the remember things. Okay. A lot of the, going through the method, I thought a lot of the things were kind of repeating things on previous pages, yep. and that is good, but I also thought, well, let's see what you think about swapping that for information that I think is like a bit more valuable if it's yeah. the, if you have already heard the other stuff. Yeah. But yeah, yeah this is yeah. a bit of a The other thing I was thinking was the, uh, did you see my arpeggios comment? You said we've changed it to S2 for the melodic arpeggios? Yes. I didn't see your comment yet, no. Uh, yeah, I think Shane mentioned it, or I mentioned it and Shane thought he liked the idea of being able to move around, have the one octave closed position on. And is that the right term? I keep saying closed position. I know that can mean a chord within, like, going in the right order, so one, three, five, yeah, instead yeah. of one, five, one, three. But is closed Stick position down. also a term for when you don't have open strings? Um, not really. It's not one that I've used, but uh, Shane, what's your take on that? Is it something that they use in jazz circles? Shane's probably... Uh, yeah, I would say closed position. Yeah. I would always say cool. closed position, and um, for doing the chord in order of one, three, and five, I would call that root position. Oh yeah, so you've got root position, but one, five, one, three is still root position, but the threes come an octave up, like an E shape major chord. Yeah, so, yeah, you could call that root position, yeah. Yeah, I, would call I, mean, I was just thinking it'd be good if we got the one octave ones going before we go for the two octave ones, and that does tie in with what uh, Jay was saying, because it is very tricky to try and get those muted open strings. So yeah. each note is just one note. So if we start with the closed position, they'll be able to hear that melodic arpeggio sound without having to go really hard on the muted open strings techniques. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think that'd be a much easier start, even though you do have to use that fourth finger and maybe roll it over it with a one, four, four for a major okay, shape. So, so just to clarify here, we're talking about let's say a C arpeggio just playing one octave. Uh, are you talking about not using open notes? Yeah, no open strings. I think would make it a little okay, easier. Right. For yeah, yeah. The okay. Idea. Yeah, right. So no open notes, just cl all closed, basically. Yep. Yeah. Right. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, that, that, that's fine, and that, that makes sense to me. Uh, you know, if we, we we think about, you know, like a, just a standard bass run, or, you know, a one, three, five, uh, you know, octave, then, yeah, that's a very simple, just doing it one from one octave to the other, and that, that, that'll, that's a good start. It, it, it really depends on, um, I think when you introduce it, you want to start off very simply, but it just depends on, on the student, I guess. If the student is, is able to pick it up faster, then you can obviously tell them to go the two octaves. I, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, the sheet. I, I'm putting one octave on there and then making another sheet. It kind of just seems a bit of a waste. I'd rather have the two octaves on there, but you can teach them one octave. So. Well, I was thinking keep the two octaves, but have a separate sheet and maybe have that for S1, just a one octave. Okay. All right. So, all right. So you're you're saying just have a very uh, a closed couple of closed arpeggios, uh, one octave for S1 rather than having no melodic at all. Yeah, I think that would make a bit more sense for them to get an idea of what melodic is. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yep. All right. Sounds good. All right. So I'll look at putting something like that together. Um, and I'll just throw it to you, Ben, first, and then we can once I work that out, um, then. 
if if we think we're happy with it, if you're happy with it, then I can try it to the other guys and see what they say. Yeah. All right. Um, I could just what, butt in uh, for a second. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. What what I I do this, and usually within the first five weeks, they can play major arpeggio and major scale in all twelve keys. Um, maybe within the first two months, if they're a little younger. So I think it's a great idea for the guitar. Yeah. How do you get them doing it, Shane? With a two, four, one, two, four, one, three, four, or three notes per string? Oh. So I can't hear Shane at all. Can Can you guys hear me? I can hear you. I've got nothing yeah. from Shane. Okay, Shane. Yeah, I can't dropped. hear Shane either. I can hear you. Okay, cool. He must have dropped out. Uh, no. and, and look. I think it's Shane's a good, you know, we should sort of listen to Shane because being a bass player, you know, most of the time learning arpeggios and melodic arpeggios is what they're doing, really, from yeah, day I was going to say, he'll know the, the, the simpler shapes that don't need to decide about that B string, and that yeah. you really going to start off with rather than having to go, here's all three note per string shapes for a major scale. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things that w when I'm there teaching guitar in the hand, I can get a better feel for it. And, and I, I know what you're saying here. There are different ways that we can introduce the melodic arpeggio, and that's really the bottom line here is with the, that I, I think, yeah, I, I agree. I think for S1, uh, it would be nice to introduce the melodic arpeggio in some shape or form, even if we just give them some very simple things to do to start off with. It, it's, and we, we are doing it, you know, especially for Senior 1, uh, with Pretty Woman. You know, it's a, it's a melodic arpeggio, so um, yeah. it's al it's already there. Uh, in so fact, I, think I was going to say some open one open string would be fine if the next note was on that string, because that'll obviously mute it anyway. Yeah. You could do yeah, a G exactly. you know, fifth string, fourth string, sorry, sixth, yeah. fifth, fourth, fourth. Yeah. And which you, which again is what happens with Pretty Woman. You know, it starts on the open E and then it yeah. yeah. And there's no it. chance of that opening ringing ring out because they're pressing down that G sharp on it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it, it's, it, again, we're, we're trying to get the concepts across to them in the beginning uh, so they at least understand the concepts. And that's that's was always my whole philosophy is that in the introduction, the five weeks, I don't, I, don't, I don't need them to do much. I just need them to understand the concepts of each of the skills, what they are, and have a, it's, that's why it's called an introduction. And, yeah. and I, th I think that helps with students for them to sort of get the, the bigger picture because then from then on we've got a template. So it, it doesn't matter how long you're going to play for, you can play for the next 50 years and you'll still be practicing scales, arpeggios, chords, etc. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so we'll do that. We'll, we'll bring the melodic arpeggios in, um, but we'll work it out first what the melodic arpeggios are going to look like. Yeah. Cool. Great. Excellent. Um, reading right, it. So still going so well. I really just wanted to say thanks again for doing that because I took a lot of loads of my students through them again yesterday. And it's just so much better having those E and F ones and then getting the rests in while it's still just E, F and G. And then getting yeah. a duet going where they get to hear both going on at once without it being more than one string. It's so much easier for everyone to go through it bit by bit by bit by bit. It, yeah, it, it, it was re really badly needed and yeah, no, thank you. For uh, the input, because it's it's getting the those you know those steps right, and that's what I found was the struggle with the PGM. With uh, I, I go way back to Mel Bay, learning with Mel Bay when I was a teenager, and just that step up from learning the you know the first string and the second string, and, and then jumping into you know all six notes at once. Um, it's it's just it, it just didn't make sense. It, it, I didn't understand it back then, but you know I understood it years later. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so, Trevor, did you want to, did you want to talk about anything else? Did you did you have a, another topic? Um, I was well. I've got a few little notes down here, so not necessarily things to cover right now, but just kind of while they were in my mind, I was just going to mention them because yeah. um, I thought it might be useful if we could do something maybe a little bit more on the skills to songs to skills. Thing because I know that's something I'm really not good on is is um, trying to relate stuff off the the USL to the skills to kind of try to keep reinforcing the relevance of it 
So yeah. maybe as a kind of future hangout, possibly we could do something on that because I know I'm not good on it. So that would be useful for me. Yeah. Um, and I think as well because I get the feeling that, that certainly I'm a little, still a little bit hazy on some of the arpeggio stuff. I was wondering if is there um, a lesson like a you know kind of YouTube video or anything like that on the melodic arpeggios, or if not, would it be possible to maybe have one of those? Um, yeah, and yeah, and how to teach them? Do you mean or? Yeah, and, and sort of demonstrating them as well, just to make sure that that kind of everyone's just to, so that there's a consistency in the way that we're all teaching them. Yep. Um, that was just a, a kind of thought and. Um, Yep. Yeah, and the other thing as well with, um, uh, I think it was Ben was mentioning about the gift vouchers for Christmas. Um, I'm kind of, I'd be interested to know what other people's experiences have been like with the conversion rates from gift vouchers because I've found with, I think I've had about three or four now and I've found with, with several of them that a, a lot of the people who've taken up the, the gift voucher intro course haven't in some cases haven't completed the course or they've been very sort of patchy with their attendance and practice and the rest of it and I kind of get the feeling there's a bit of a, a sense of because they're getting the lessons for free because it's a gift they're not really attaching very much value to them and they just kind of see it as something of oh they'll kind of turn up because somebody's giving it to them as a gift and they don't want that person to feel disappointed but they're not really seeing the value of the lessons and that's the pattern I seem to find you know, on a kind of small number. So I didn't know how other people had, what experiences other people have had with that. Seeing as we come up to Christmas, it was just a thought I was throwing out there, really. Okay. So I'll just because there's a couple of questions in there, so I'll I'll sort of work through them. Um, the so we'll, we'll go over well the gift voucher because you you just you're already onto that. You you are going to get obviously a high percentage of people who are going to you know get a gift voucher for Christmas because. Uh, Mum or dad or Uncle Joe thinks that you know you like the guitar and you've just bought one recently and, and you're sounding pretty terrible. So hey, here's a gift voucher. Um, or people buy a guitar for Christmas because that's what they wanted. Or someone uh, sorry to buy a relative or whoever a guitar and so you want to give give them some lessons as part of the package. And they turn up and they're not really they haven't thought about the lessons. They're not even that interested in the lessons. They do want to play a guitar, but they figure that they're going to learn on YouTube. So you end up with a student who's not really committed. Uh, it, you know, it's a bit like a blind date where they they didn't arrange it or someone else arranged it for them. Arranged date. Um, they didn't want to be there. They're just there to humour the person who gave it to them. I do understand that, and you're going to get a percentage of that. It, it, it's just it's, it is a statistic. So it really depends. You, it, I found when we did it that we that I, I could split people into three. Groups, and I'm not saying that they're even numbers in the groups, but three categories, and that is that were the ones who got the gift voucher who wanted the gift voucher, and they were they would often have asked for it, so they were fine. They were just like any other student enrolling. Then there were the ones on the other end who didn't want the gift voucher, didn't ask for the gift voucher, and didn't really want to be there. They were just there because they were following. They didn't want to waste the the gift voucher. And then there were the people in the middle again who didn't really ask for the gift voucher, um, but they they saw the value in the lessons. So when they turned up, they they didn't come really with the idea of really needing lessons or whatever. But then when they had the lessons, they will they could see the value in it. And um, so I, I think they're worth it, even though you're going to get a higher percentage. Uh, you still, if you sell the gift vouchers, it's it's again, it's just like a, it's it's marketing, and you're going to get students who are going to come in, and some of them won't work out. But that's just how it is. Sure. All right. Um, okay, so the the skills to songs, uh, if we sort of just just touch on on that, and the, the, I guess everyone has a different approach. But what I used to do a lot uh, with my skills to songs was was I would look at their ultimate song lists, and I would make sure that I had copies of that, and then I would go and listen to those songs. I would spend time. At least once a week, I would sit down for an hour, maybe two, and just work out songs and, and bits and pieces from songs. And sometimes I would sit there to, you know, often to annoying my wife or whatever. Um, I'd be working out songs from television themes and 
you know, news and, and whatever. I would just be there with the guitar in my hand and I'd hear something and I'd work it out. And then I would use those uh, little bits and pieces in my lessons to demonstrate certain skills. And I found that, that as I got into that as a habit, because I was doing it, you know, I was really working things out every day. It, it was very easy. I had plenty of things to draw from. And in today's world, it's so easy because if you don't want to be bothered working it out even, you can just go and find a YouTube video of someone teaching it um, and you can pick it, pick it up very quickly. So uh, I think that, do you, do you know what I mean? As long as you have that thing and you just got to find which, which, uh, which will connect with which song. So if you're, um, you know, you're wanting to do something around a, a, a uh, a certain arpeggio, let's say the, you, you can't really teaching the, the C major arpeggio, melodic arpeggio, then listen listen to some songs and see if you can hear something. It doesn't, obviously it doesn't have to be in C as long as you can transpose it and then you've got something that you can use to, to exemplify uh, that particular, and especially if you can get it from their checklist. And what you'll tend to do, at the beginning it'll seem hard because you're kind of trying to put all this together, but as you build up more songs and you start to connect more of the songs to the skills. And, and as you look at songs, you can see some songs have just about all the skills are there. Um, you know, the whole range of things that you can pull out of just one song sometimes. It's, it's incredible what you can get out of it. You, you take something like Bohemian Rhapsody, Queens, uh, there's lots of different things in there uh, which you can draw out of it to use it. It doesn't have to be just guitar, by the way. Uh, you can take vocal lines, uh, you can you can it could be a piano line, a bass line. It doesn't matter as long as that it's something that people will identify with um, and be able to you'll be able to use it as a demonstration. And I, I made this point the other night of that when you're doing the skills of song, it's not not about teaching the song or even teaching the riff. It's simply about demonstrating uh, how that what they're learning right now. So if they're doing that C melodic arpeggio, for example, then what you're doing is saying that it can be used in lots of different ways, um, but here's one example, and then just th show them that example, but not, not we're learning the song, this is just, just showing you how it's used. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, Try. no, it does, yeah. it does. It's, um, yeah. it's yeah, basically, it's, it's kind of what I was thinking, So, but it's given me some extra ideas on it, so that's good. Yeah, I, I, I saw a thing, I don't know if it was one of your videos, but you used an example from um, a Rolling Stones song. Was it one that you did? Uh, I don't know if it was one of mine. I don't think it sounds familiar. Um, I'm just trying to remember. Maybe it wasn't you. Um, but, yeah, there was something that I saw, an example, uh, in one of the videos that I got from one of you guys. Um, I, sorry, I, I thought it was yours, but, yeah. But have you used any songs? But the, but are you using any songs? Um, yeah, I'm. Um, I am trying to introduce them. It's sort of a bit. I don't know. It sort of seems a bit cheesy sometimes when I'm doing it, and I'm sort of saying, "Oh, we're doing picking." And oh, by the way, in this particular song, you know, this is how you could use it. So it sort of seems a little bit. But you know, I guess that's just getting used to to sort of introducing it in a way that's not going to seem too much like a sort of sales pitch, really. But uh, yeah. I'm I'm trying to. I just it's something I really need to do more, and it's really, like you said, it's making the time to sit down and and maybe make up like a playlist of of songs from a student's song list, and just yeah. you know make that up as a playlist and just sit down and listen to it and and try yeah. and pick out things from it and say, oh, okay, there's a good example of an arpeggio, or that's a good example of a picking technique, or that's you know whatever it might be. I suppose it's just trying to find. Just trying to listen out for for sort of things within the song that are going to be usable as examples. Yeah, yeah, and because you, you what you, what will happen is that when, when you use examples that, that are on their their ultimate song list and that they know and they like, uh, it, it it won't come off as cheesy. They'll you, you'll see them. They'll smile. They get excited. Oh wow, that's that's the song I like because they they're hearing. Uh, the, it, you just go back to your, your your own you know early years. I know what I was like when I saw someone play a song that I really liked on the guitar, my teacher would play it, I would just like, oh, wow, you know, he's actually playing the song and it sounds like the real thing. And, yeah, it, it's an exciting moment, especially for a beginner, to see a real guitarist playing a song that they like and know. 
Sure. Hey, hop in there. Yeah, go Ben. You remember on Monday we were talking about this, and I was going to say I'm still up for being a compiler of a database, kind of like we were thinking Fernando might do with those YouTube videos. So yeah. if anyone's willing to send me copies of their ultimate song lists, I'm just going to keep adding, I'm going to start making a database. I've got some scans of my students' ultimate song lists, and the more up-to-date, the better. So if you could tell me, yeah, you know, I don't need a name, but the age of the student and then the songs on the ultimate song list, I'd then love yeah. to go through and I can put some details in, like name, not name, like age of student who likes it, and then the skills involved in it, in which section, which skills are matching which um, a checklist. So, for example, I can say the chords here match J1, but the rhythms are J6. So you can start practicing this with a simple thing, and it will then be a... Like you say, you don't want to teach the songs, but you do want to get them excited about the songs and kind of playing that kind of stuff as soon as possible. So yeah. if we do have a match to that, we can then just pick for those when we've got the four blank songs for the checklists. Teachers can just go, well, my group is J1, they're this age, which songs have skills that match some J1 bits in this age? And then they can pick those bits as the checklist items. So you could say, play the riff for Pretty Woman, but you could just as easily say, well, this uses a C major scale, so play the chorus vocal melody for any other song, right? Knock on Heaven's Door, even though that's already on our checklists. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Right. If we start slowly, and I just do some with mine. And Trevor, do you want to volunteer or Shane? Anyone want to send me some ultimate song lists? Yeah, I'll I'll send you some through. Be useful to know. Cool, because then I'll do the working out what it is. I don't know how precisely I'll be able to say this one perfectly match J1. This one perfectly matches S2. But it'll be a start. I can write down what the chords are. I can have a guess at the level. And then once it becomes a shared document, people can start kind of saying, I think this is actually a little bit tricky for that. I think this one could be made simpler and go in there. It might be interesting to know if there's a lot of the same songs cropping up on different... That was another thing. It would make it much easier. I could just have a tally and say, yep, yeah, and again, and again, and again. And you can then just sort. I imagine, David, you know a program I'd be able to use that would allow me to sort by all these different things. As far as I know, yep. when I use numbers, if I sort it by a line, it'll just rearrange that column. It won't rearrange the whole... Can you group things by row and then sort by column? Uh, yeah, you, you can do... A file maker can do these kind of things. Uh, it just depends on yeah what... Yeah, it, so if, if you've got... What you're saying is that you've got uh, the song and then the skills. Is that right? So we're going to make a... Uh, there would be a few different criteria for each song. So yeah. this song would have the age of the person who requested it, the tally for how many times it's been requested, and then the skills, and then hopefully a level. Maybe for each skill, maybe just an overall level. I'll see how easy it is to do. Yeah. Or even even maybe just like the top three or four songs for each one, you know, the most common ones might be useful to have. Yeah, I can start off with them, and it depends how quickly people end up sending me stuff. If I end up with 300 songs, I'll probably just do a basic thing for the top 50 or the top 10 or whatever I manage, and then share it with people, and you guys can say, yes, no, change this, do this. This would be another useful feature. Yeah, yeah. And so you can, uh, and I'm just thinking out loud here, but with, with the songs... You can take a song. It's not about the whole song. It's just about finding snippets. It could simply be one bar. Uh, it could be, you know, a, a, a vocal line. It could be, like, like I said, it could be anything where we can get that example. And and when you when you do that, you're going to find, uh, you know, heaps and heaps of stuff. And if you can go, really, I think if you start looking at top forty, you know, whatever's whatever's trending, uh, you, you know, if if you think it's not going to go down well with with certain kinds of students because it's not cool or, or whatever. Um, that's all right. You can admit it, but the if you if you're looking for things that people are recognising and familiar with, um, I think that's the way to go. And that's what I found is that um, and, and and I would test it on the students as well. I would there would be a song that was really popular at that point, and I'd play. It, and then I go, oh, that's that's you know that's not cool. And all right, we won't do that one again. Um, and then I move on to something else. And so just getting a feel, and it's not just looking at their ultimate song list. Sometimes it's testing things on them 
So if you even if, if, if we can get these items on this, that's great. Um, but if you are able to even just look on YouTube and see which uh, videos are getting the most hits um, as far as you know views and so forth, yeah, you, you'll get you'll get a feel. Go to iTunes and, and look at what the the songs that are selling. Uh, at, at the, the best, so I think there's a lot there. If I if I come same with me, if I come across things, um, I can you know, for example, um, because I pulled a couple of songs up for, um, and and the way the way I found them was at the gym. They're playing them on the thing, and you know that they're they're repeating these songs over and over again. Um, so they must be trending, and then I pulled them out and played them for Mia, the ones that were trending, and then I could tell which ones she likes because I, what I do is I put them on a, a playlist. And then she listens to that to that playlist, and then I know because she go and repeat the ones that she really likes. Um, but if I just give you right now um, as an example, um, where are we here? Um, I'll, I'll just give you a couple of quick songs that that she's really gone for. Um, so this will be your six, sort of six, seven year old category. Um, but I think they're really popular with older people as well. So um, where are we here? Um, so there's a song "Cool for Summer," um, and it, it's got a little run at the beginning of it. Um, so this little piano run, uh, which which would be great for for something. Um, and then um, there's a song called "Flashlight" by Jesse J. Um, I don't know if there's anything out of that, but she seems to play that one a lot. Um, and the other one was the On My Mind. So they're, they're, they're the three ones that she seems to really like and, and she continuously plays. And that On My Mind was the one I think I mentioned on Monday. Um, and yeah, I had another listen to it actually. And it's it's basically, uh, I think I said that it was a uh, the C, uh, what did I say, a C pentatonic major, a major pentatonic, but it's actually it starts on the G. Um, it, it's got a lot of flan, a lot of phasing on it. So, so yeah. But it's got it's 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 basically a scale. They're playing. Well, it's basically an arpeggio. Sorry, it's a it's a G arpeggio, um, G minor arpeggio. So. You go for that. Yeah, yeah I, I got summer and I got on my mind, but I missed the title of the Jesse J one. Uh, Jesse J one is called Flashlight. Flashlight. You have an artist for Cool for Summer or On My Mind? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cool, cool for summer is Demi Lovato. Demi Lovato. Um, yeah, she's the same girl that does the "Let It Go" song. Um, oh yeah, then, she did. She did do the song, the version on the film, did she? She did. Yeah. Now she did the radio version, I think. Yeah. From yeah. Memory. Um, and, Demi Lovato on there, so I'm going to say anyway, so that'd be good. Cool. And then the "On My Mind" is. I think she's English, Ellie Goulding. Cool. I'll yeah. check those three out. Yeah, cool. And and one of the things I do, and I used to do this a lot before, I haven't done it in recent years, but I would look at if I see uh, a song that's that's popular, trending, I I would look behind who who produced it, who were the you know the, the writers and so forth, and then that leads you to other songs uh, which have you know similar appeal and then you can pick out bits and pieces and then you kind of, you know what I mean, you go down, a, a, you, you find a, a track where you, you're finding songs and, and popular things that people like. You know, I, I think, you know, I don't, I don't really know any of his songs, but Ed Sheeran I, I know is very popular. Um, I'm sure he's got some songs that you can pull out, uh, you know, ideas from. So r really, yeah, looking for what's trending. Because even if some of them, they sort of say, hey, that's not cool or I don't really, I'm not really into that, whatever. They still know the songs, so it, it, it still helps to sort of you know explain how something is done. Yeah, and a lot of my adult students, they they they're not bothered. They just want to learn some songs. They don't really care if it's a song they like. So I knew one of the three adults I have for my last lesson yesterday has "Killing in the Name" by Rage on their ultimate song list. So yeah. I thought E minor tonic, start of bomb track. That ding 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 ding. That. Yeah. <laughs> Just get a go going over that minor pentatonic. Doesn't have to be fast. And the whole yeah. rest of the song. Yeah. F sharp minor. But 
just that E minor pentatonic they're already learning. So and I've mentioned sequences to them, so I can say here's an example of sequences being used, but not just being a sequence. So jump up and then just sequence down and then stop sequencing and just and that gives yep. them much more ideas of we're learning all this stuff but remember you're meant to chop and change pick pieces and it's not yep. just for this section of the song I will play up and down the E minor pentatonic scale yeah yeah that's right that's right because uh, and I think if we can kind of use some of these things even as inspiration to write some reading material as well uh, yeah. because yeah if it's sort of the reading material you know because I, I don't see a time where the reading material will, will, will stop and we'll go this is it this is all we're going to stick with I think it can evolve and I think we can come up with more reading material that's 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 kind of you know hinting at songs that, that they know um, but it's our kind of arrangement and it's not exactly that or, or you know it's just maybe even just cool and creative uh, but a bit more trendy, not something that sounds like, um, you know, Song of Joy all the time. Yeah. And we can still have the same reading that we have as the standard progression. And then for anyone who wants more, they can just have reading supplement one, reading supplement two. Yep. Yep, exactly. Because, you know, Shane's book that he's done is, is fantastic. And, and you know, having that as a, as a second uh, material, and I'm just trying to work out, um, Shane, are you there? I'm not sure if you're if you're with us. You dropped out before. If he is, I'd love to know what he used because I'm I'm so tempted to buy Sibelius, but did you say around six hundred quid? I'm yeah, he did use Sibelius. you used, correct? Yep. Yeah. Damn. Um, I, I was just going to ask you the, it, because I'm, what I'm trying to think about is how we can integrate it. I, I want to have it so that it's obviously got your name on it because you need to be credited for that that uh, you know that material. It's it's, it's your material. But I'm just thinking of the numbering, uh, which is the problem. It's because if we have, if I put it integrated into the reading material that we have, yours has got a numbering system and the other one's got a numbering system, so it would look funny. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So I, I'm thinking maybe what we can do is just if you could send me a copy without the numbering somehow, um, even if you wanted to send me the Sibelius, so I can I can do it. But if if I had something without the numbering, then what I could do is put it in as a Shane Alessio uh, supplement reading. Um, do you know what I mean? And, and yeah. it's a credit to you. It could say it comes from your book. And um, and even if you want to put a book together, as we were talking about before, then it can be people can refer to more reading exercises from your book and the teachers can recommend it as well. So. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, just take out the numbers then. All right, cool. And then, I, yeah, I'll just put them in as a page. So that way what will happen is that, you know, for lesson one, I'll just take whatever pages are relevant for lesson uh, level one, sorry, and then add them into the level one, and then same with level two, etc. And that way, yeah, we've got the our standard G yeah. four reading, and then we've got this Shane Alessio supplements. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. Yeah, I mean, and anyone else can add as well if they want. The to ones, the way I've written it out is reading lesson one is June uses the scales from junior level one and reading lesson seven uses the scales from junior level seven. So, okay. Okay, cool. And then and then the adults just kind of do what they usually form four yep. and five on level four and six and seven on level five. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. That's kind of it, what, yeah. I've, what I've been using them for. Yeah. All right. All right, cool. So I'll have a look at that, and yeah, if I've got some more questions for you when, once I've got a, my hands on it, then I'll, I'll ask you from there about yeah, just to make sure we get it matched up. Thanks, Shane. That's brilliant. Um, yes, Ben. For the um the numbering, I still think while we're using the PGM, it could be good to have a bit of an explanation for the reading root kind of thing. Maybe if it's just a page that's a diagram that shows you when each one starts, because at the moment I've been using. James reading lesson one is a bit tough for J1. It matches up with S1, but mm -hmm. our reading, the G4 new reading exercises, is J1. And then I'm adding Shane's one straight after that. Instead of using the one page of exercises, use that double side of Shane's lesson one. And that takes you through all the G notes without adding anything in and makes it a little bit tricky. And if you want, let's you talk about some theory concepts like changing key. Where it's tune in G, now in C, now in A minor. 
Yeah. Maybe we should have a session, um, you know, whoever wants to join, we can do a session um, just where we can have a hangout just on the reading uh, and go through it together uh, because I think, yeah, there's some room for, for work, for uh, improvement on, on the reading overall. And I just need to be able to see some things as well. I think we can get these things in front of us because I don't have them in front of me now. And then we can say, you know, these exercises, these pages. So we, it, does that sound like a good idea for you guys? If we can do I'd that like now? to do that. Yeah, okay, cool. So maybe let's aim for next Wednesday, this this time, um, if we, we we start off with the reading. Uh, you know, if uh, if any of you got any other questions, we can do that. But we'll start off with the reading, but just let's just be prepared, and maybe in the meantime, uh, it doesn't matter if Shane doesn't have it ready, but um, that way I will have, you know, the, the, the PDFs up, you guys will have them up, and then we can talk about these things. Because it's, sometimes it's hard when you're talking about something, I'm not sure what exactly yeah. we're looking at. So. Um, shall I, I'll see if by next Wednesday then, shall I see if I can do a little progression chart? Yep. So that you see, because some people don't see the connection between going through the G4 exercises that cover the first string notes and going through the PGM first string ones, then looking at the the things that cover the second string notes and then PGM lesson two. Some people are just going straight into PGM lesson two and doing some of the reading exercises and not realizing that they're not really ready to instantly play all those songs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's that's what we need. Yeah. What what we what we're doing here, which I think is very different to what's been done in, you know, your, your standard reading books, the popular ones, your PGMs, your Mel Basil, where we're actually developing it through the teaching, um, and, and getting the feedback and working out what's gonna be right and, and really getting it down to you know, doing the, the whole Doug Lemob thing if you like. Um, of really working out what strategies and what exercises, so to speak, need to be in what order in order to get students to read. Because that's what we want, is we want students, because what we, we know and everyone knows is that, that most guitar students who take up reading give up pretty quickly. Um, and that's why a lot of teachers don't teach reading, because they start with a Mel Bay or a PGM and then they get to page 10 and, and some of the students don't want to do it anymore. Um, or they, they're just not practicing or resisting, and that's where I think if we can get this right, where the steps flow and they do move through each step in a natural course, uh, I think that we can we can really get a reputation uh, around reading. Uh, you know, learn to read. We we make it easy because we take you through the steps, the, the logical steps. Yeah. 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 I, I, I'm just thinking of what I would have. I really wished I had. Um, you know, when I started out, I wish there was. Because it, it wasn't easy for me uh, learning to read, because I learned late, and it, w it was a struggle. And it's simply because there wasn't a method out there that, that took me through those um, nice steps. Okay, so yeah, so let's let's do that next week, and and really see if we can get the the right exercises in the right order, um, and whatever's missing, we can sort of try and develop some exercises in between, and uh, come up with with something pretty special. Um, all right, cool. We're done. I will see you guys. Um, I've got another hangout later in the week if you want to join. Um, but otherwise, I'll see you at the next hangout. Cool. Thanks, Great. guys. Thanks, David. See you, Trevor. Yeah. See, see you, Shane. See you, Ben. Still there.